purpose of the Flick Reedy Education Enterprises is to promote individual moral responsibility through education. How do we do this? We study and discuss the interrelationships of history, philosophy, social studies, and economics. We do not dictate. We do not make statements as to what we think you should or should not do. We do not unduly burden this program with footnotes, references, or complete documentation. However, we do give sufficient data to bring this discussion into proper focus. We invite you to delve further into the necessary historical and statistical data to develop a deeper understanding of truth and a keener sense of individual moral responsibility. Earlier, we established that individual freedom is the mainspring of human progress, is that vital ingredient that has given us a highly spiritual way of life, plus outstanding material wealth and abundance. All else without freedom has given mankind 6,000 years of poverty, starvation, and social injustice of all kinds. Let's examine what goes into the makeup of freedom to see if we ourselves can discover what makes freedom the mainspring of human progress. Let's see what makes freedom work so well. Where do we get this freedom? Thomas Jefferson said, The God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? The culture the Bible generates, both Old and New Testaments, is one of individual worth, individual dignity, individual salvation, and individual freedom. But there is another world altogether. It says that man is not free. It is the world of regimentation. Except for the United States, regimentation has exerted its heavy influence over mankind with but few and momentary pauses for 6,000 years. Let's see why regimentation tends to lead to poverty, starvation, and social injustice. The early American settlers had no preconceived idea of building a culture. They made mistakes, true, we all do. But this they did. They took the ideas found in the Bible and planted them in the soil of human intellect. As their efforts took root and grew, the philosophy of freedom grew. It expressed itself in the political and economic form we know as the American way of life. These political and economic concepts are rooted in a belief in God and in our God-given freedoms and responsibilities. Today, the forces of regimentation continue to challenge individual freedom. One of the most recent forces of regimentation to challenge freedom is that of Marxian atheism. Its Bible is the Communist Manifesto, published in 1848. As the ideas in this book grew and developed, they resulted in a system of government and economics, as do all ideologies. As an aid in understanding how these two philosophies affect man, we will develop a comparison of the two worlds, considering how the climate of freedom and the climate of regimentation affect you and me as human beings. We will then predict how people tend to react to these two opposite climates of regimentation or freedom. For simplicity's sake, we can say, under these conditions, man probably will react like this. As you watch and listen, see if you can predict, before I share my thoughts with you, what you think most people's reaction would be to the two different climates described. Let's start with the related ideas of reliance and responsibility. With freedom, reliance is put on the individual to care for himself and his family. He's expected to develop self-reliance. An individual is expected to assume responsibility as the running mate of his God-given freedom. You tend to react by working hard, showing initiative and resourcefulness. When problems arise, you say, what should I do about it? You accept responsibility as a measure of your stature and growth. You know that for every ounce of freedom, you must assume an ounce of responsibility. Under regimentation, the state takes over all significant responsibility. Man is not permitted to become self-reliant. The state requires that man be dependent upon the state. Individual planning on important matters is simply not tolerated. People tend to react by giving up. They cease trying to grow more or produce more. When problems arise, they say, I hope they will do something. To prevent a man from becoming self-reliant, now or at retirement, a great percentage of the fruits of his labor is extracted from him by force or threat of force by the state, on the promise that the state will take care of him. Next, let us consider the ideas of talents and reward. With freedom, talents of all kinds are encouraged because reward is obtained from your fellow man according to the value of your talents to your fellow man. 
whether it be the creation of a marvelous new medicine, new labor-saving device, or a toy like the Hula Hooper skateboard. Acceptance and reward for your talent come from your fellow man. You tend to develop your God-given talents. You encourage your fellow man to develop his talents. You give your best efforts, striving to improve the quality and quantity of your service to your fellow man. This is a selfish motive, but a healthy one, because it benefits all concerned. Do you begin to see more clearly the marvelous working of freedom? Under regimentation, talents are repressed or molded to fit state plans. If weapons of war are called for, or heavy industry, or athletic teams, or ballet groups, man's talents are driven to fulfill state plans. Reward is determined entirely by the state. Service to your fellow man is unimportant. Only service to the state matters. As a means of control, people are kept at a minimum subsistence. Of course, the ruling class is well taken care of at the expense of the people, the masses. What happens? Talents lie dormant and undeveloped. Production and creativity are lost. People tend to work only hard enough to prevent punishment. There is little or no reward for extra effort or ability. People become servile to the state, become apple polishers. Can you see why under these conditions production and services decrease? Why growing enough food for their own people has never been achieved? You begin to see more clearly the paralysis of regimentation. Now think about the idea of possessions and land. With freedom, possessions, land, and the whole concept of private property are advocated, respected, and protected by the state. Thrift is encouraged. What you save will not be taken away from you. You work to acquire property as the means of comfort and as an aid in becoming self-reliant. With land, you become stable, have roots. You seek to improve your land for your own purposes. You can leave it to your children and grandchildren. Under regimentation, possessions and land, for the most part, are not obtainable. The state owns everything of significance. People are forced into a hand-to-mouth existence. No wealth can be collected or saved in the form of possessions or land. Man tends to react by having little or no incentive. He can gain so little, he works only hard enough to prevent punishment. He looks to the state as the benevolent provider of goods and services. Unable to acquire land, he has no roots. Ultimately, the people have to be herded about like cattle to serve the state. Physical matter in motion. What is man's reaction? He has no incentive, no motivation to produce and create. Consider next the concepts of justice and control. With freedom, justice is equal for all, by law, written, constant, and impartial, based on moral and spiritual values. It is practiced and taught as the divine precept through revelations made known to man by the Almighty. Control is primarily internal, by self-discipline, appealing to the God-given ideas of man. External control by the state isn't necessary, unless and until you deny the rights and freedoms of your fellow man. You tend to react by being sure of yourself and your actions. You have a yardstick against which to measure your actions. You know that morally correct behavior will not result in punishment by the state. You tend to govern your actions according to morals and ethics, with concern for the results of your actions and behavior on your fellow man. Under regimentation, justice is variable, elastic, stretching and contracting to serve the state's interests, not the individual's. It may change from day to day. Control is by means of fear and use of force by the state. Since justice cannot always be moral and at the same time serve the interests of the state, it is often immoral or tends toward immorality. Man tends to react by being unsure of himself and his actions. He is reluctant to act, adopting a wait-and-see attitude. Man reacts like an animal at the end of a whip, always in fear. Moral and spiritual values tend to be unimportant. Only survival and avoidance of punishment are important. How much do you think is going to be produced, grown, and created under these conditions? Now, let's continue our analysis with consideration of the values of virtue and respect. With freedom, virtue is taught and practiced as a divine rule, preempting all man-made law. For man does not live by bread alone. Respect is encouraged in self, which permits respect for others, a requirement in a moral society. Included within the concept of virtue is that of compassion, charity, and love by individuals for other individuals in need and want. Only in extreme cases should compassion and charity be delegated to the state in place of individual action. One noted theologian philosopher in rejecting the adoption of socialism stated it this way. 
The idea, then, that the civil government should, at its own discretion, penetrate and pervade the family and the household is a great and pernicious mistake. True, if a family finds itself in great difficulty, utterly friendless, and without prospect of help, it is right that extreme necessity be met by public aid, for each family is a part of the Commonwealth. You tend to react by recognizing your creation in the spiritual image of the Almighty. Our religion, law, and philosophy reflect virtue. Our observance leads us to self-respect, then respect for others where merited. You extend to your fellow man compassion, charity, and love when he is in need or want. Under regimentation, materialism is more important than God, and as such is a denial of God. Some forms of regimentation make a point of denying the existence of God. Under these conditions, there is little or no basis for virtue, little or no basis for respect, for either self or others. Respect exists only for the state, its power and authority. Man tends to react by losing both virtue and respect. Man cannot worship materialism and God. Respect tends to exist only for the state. Murder, lying, and deceit are presumed to be perfectly all right and often encouraged if they serve the interests of the state. Charity is given over as a function of the all-powerful state. Compassion and love of man by man dies. To conclude our brief comparison, consider the attitude toward you, man, and your individuality. With freedom, you, man, are considered to have both a body and a soul, are considered to be a divine creation. The moral and spiritual values you reflect are held to be important. Your individuality is recognized and respected, is given high regard. Your individuality is that which makes you different from every other person on earth and is another reflection of your creation by the Almighty. How will you tend to react? You tend to react in a moral and spiritual way so as to reflect your creation by God. You tend to treat your fellow man as a divine creation also, treating his individual differences with dignity and consideration. Under regimentation, Man is considered to be nothing more than a physical being. Marx said man is nothing more than physical matter in motion, of little or no consequence in himself. Marx said man has no soul. Under these conditions, man's individuality is suppressed for the sake of the state. Individuality or individual differences which are inconvenient to the state cannot be tolerated. As merely a number in the mass of society, the individual has no individual rights. How will man tend to react? I'll bet you're predicting, as I do, that man tends to react animal-like, seeking to please his rulers as the means of softening the harshness of existence. Moral considerations are unimportant. Individual conscience is subjugated to the diluted conscience of the mass of society. Man gives up his beliefs and standards in order to survive. Man yields to the state mold, becomes a number, loses identity as an individual. We see in the comparison of our two worlds what the forces of both freedom and regimentation produce in the actions, reactions, attitudes, and behavior of man. We see the cause and effect, the seed and the fruit. What effect, other than a high spiritual life with high moral standards, prosperity, and abundance is probable with the motivation and incentive provided by freedom? On the other hand, what effect other than poverty, starvation, and moral decay could you predict with the lack of motivation under regimentation? The analysis of our two worlds chart is little more than the analysis of the nature of man, his wants, his desires, his hopes, and his ambitions, and those external forces which motivate and control his incentive to make the most of his God-given abilities, with which he is blessed and endowed. How closely did your predictions parallel my ideas on the subject? No matter if we differed a bit here and there, the important thing is that all of us begin to examine the basic causes involved begin to see more clearly the blessings of freedom and the horrors and failings of regimentation. As other basic considerations come to your mind in the future, you put them into the framework of the two worlds chart and see what reactions you would predict resulting from the climate and external forces applied upon you, man.